So my name is Jayla Burton. I am the project manager for the Cancer Leaders Like Us program at the LGBT Cancer Network. Um, I am such, um, I'm so excited to be here today and be able to lead this amazing program. Cancer Leaders Like Us is a community of emerging leaders that identify as LGBTQ and are BIPOC and are interested in pursuing careers in public health. Um, and then I also work very closely with Shai, so I'll go ahead and let Shai introduce themselves. Hi there, I'm Shai Seelot and I am a project associate on Cancer Leaders Like Us. And yeah, it's great to be here. Awesome. And then we have a special guest today who is also from the network. I know typically um, we have folks come in to do our career talks that are from outside organizations, but today we're featuring one of our very own, um, Emil Gunovich, and they are going to be talking with us today about data. So I'm going to pass it along to Emil um, to give us an amazing presentation. And then if you all have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as we go along, or we can save them to the end and we will facilitate a question and answer. Thanks, Jayla. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Gunovich. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm coming to you from the land of the Ho-Chunk people in Madison, Wisconsin today, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about my favorite thing in the whole world, which is data and how we can change our relationship with data and how it's not just boring numbers all the time. So, yeah, I guess we can go ahead and get into it. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So before I get started, it would be um, a huge disservice to not acknowledge some of the most um, important teachers in my life that really informed and shaped how I do uh, data work and evaluation. Um, and those people are on the screen right now. Um, Abigail Echo Hawk, if you've never listened to her speak or have not connected with her in any way, I urge you to because she is just phenomenal and has the most beautiful brain. Um, she is the director for the Urban Indian Health Institute and the executive vice president for the Seattle Indian Health Board. Um, I also would like to acknowledge my good friend, Melissa Dowd, who is a tribal veteran liaison with the Wisconsin Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, so much of my work has been informed with working with her in the tribes in northern Wisconsin, specifically the Lac de Flambeau Reservation. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Heather Krause, which has started an organization called We All Count, which is a project for advocating for data equity, and it is free to join. They do have classes that you could sign up for, which I totally recommend. They're absolutely worth the cost, but there is a community of practice that you can join in if you'd like to hear more about how to make data more equitable and things like that. So definitely want to plug that. All right, deep breath. I'm just going to go for it right off the bat. Data the, in the history of data is rooted in racism, colonization, ableism, and homophobia. There is a really dark history associated with data. Um, I know a lot of times um, we like to say that data is unbiased and data is, um, oh no, I think folks maybe can't see slides. I'm not sure. I just saw it pop up. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> The data has been used to divide people for a long time uh, rather than bringing people together. So a lot of the work that I do now is trying to heal some of that um, darkness that has come out of research and everything that's come out of data. Um, for example, if you wanna go to the next slide, um, you all you have to do is look at the US census to see from the very beginning, data and categorization of people has been used to divide us. Um, if you look at the 1860 census, um, they had three race categories. Um, eventually, you know, obviously it's changed. The U.S. Census is revisited, um, not as often as it should be, but is revisited about every 10 years. Um, and so this has changed, but I really wanted to root um, the way that I talk about data and the way that I work with data, this is really the foundation of how I approach it. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, as we're talking about the US Census data and how data can be used to categorize people and exclude people, it would be remiss to not talk about the history of statistics and data and how they um, 
really have a shared history with the history of eugenics, which is obviously a terrible practice. If you have thoughts of Nazis coming to mind, this is exactly what Nazi ideology was about. Um, the fact that you could breed humans selectively to get rid of certain traits that were deemed undesirable. And those undesirable traits are, you know, <laughs> based in um, racism, ableism, homophobia, all of these things are really um, the root of this whole movement that was very popular at one point in the United States. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, specifically, if you're not familiar with this term, um, I kind of talked about it, but basically it's treating humans as if they were guinea pigs. Um, it was largely developed by Sir Francis Galton. Um, if that name sounds familiar to you, um, it's because you've probably heard this person's name if you've taken any kind of statistics class um, in school or if you've studied um, statistics in any kind of way. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, these are some other names you might be familiar with if you've done any kind of statistics in the work that you've done. Um, that we have Ronald Fisher, if you've ever heard of the Fisher test, um, ANOVA, um, the um, term of F tests, the concept of a null hypothesis, which is really the, the building blocks for um, when you start to learn statistics in school. This is usually where you really kind of start out. This is considered, he is considered one of the fathers of statistics. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, Francis Galton again, um, some of his major contributions to mathematical statistics include um, the use of quantiles and linear regression techniques, which is a little bit more advanced into in statistics, but something you definitely are going to run across in any kind of um, statistics course that you might be taking. And you can go to the next slide. Um, we also have Carl Pearson, if you've ever heard of the Pearson test or p-values, if you've <laughs> read any kind of scientific journal article um, when we're trying to um, prove or disprove your null hypothesis, a lot of those values are determined based on a p-value that you score. Um, Carl Pearson also founded the first university statistics department and the first academic journal focused on statistics in general. And unfortunately, um, these fathers of statistics who are all contemporaries and did know each other and um, did have relationships with each other, um, they were all eugenicists. Um, you can go ahead and skip to the uh, next slide. So um, it's something to consider as we approach data and we're learning about these mathematical concepts. Um, math is, you know, and when I was going through school, I was told math is just, it's, it's this binary thing. It's either right or wrong. It's um, something that has no sort of bias to it. But as you're looking at the people who developed the way that we approach statistics today, if you're looking at them and these, um, genocidal ideologies that they espoused, it really does have an effect um, on how we look at data today, even if we don't necessarily think of that right off the bat. Like it's, they're inherently intertwined, the history. And so one thing that I really want to get across to folks is that whether or not we want it to be, data is biased. It's going to be biased by the people who are running the studies. It's going to be biased by the people doing the analysis, the people communicating the data, the people interpreting it. It'll be biased based on the person that's consuming that information. Um, and that doesn't always mean that it's always going to be a bad thing, but I like to highlight this just so that we can be aware of it aware that bias does exist in things like math and science, because um, for such a long time, I guess, just while I was going through, it was held out to me as like, this is just, this is the one truth. This cannot be changed. And, you know, we know now that that's just not true. Um, and I have some examples. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, this is a chart from the Georgia Department of Health, not to like put them on blast, but this is part of their COVID-19 dashboard. And if you look at this, this was supposed to communicate that um, COVID-19 cases um, were trending downward and that the state was ready to reopen, you know. And if you look at this at first glance, it looks exactly like that. You see these different um, 
bar charts for different counties in Georgia, and it looks like the case counts are going down. Um, but if you look a little bit closer at the bottom at the x-axis, you might see a little bit of time travel happening. <laughs> so um, if you start at the left, so we're going the, the 28th of April, the 27th, 29th, then May 1st, then May 30th. So basically all of these dates are not <laughs> in order at all. So if you go to the next slide, this is actually what they would look like if we reorganize them based on, you know, actual linear time as we understand it. <laughs> um, and it's not telling the same picture. Um, so this is kind of an example about, you know, there was an agenda that was trying to be pushed at the time that first graph was published and that biased their data because they were trying to communicate something that maybe wasn't true. Um, another example of this, if you want to go to the next slide, um, this is just a, a map of the United States. We see some Canada, Mexico hanging out there. I'm sure everyone has seen this all their life. This is the map as we have uh, been taught to see it in school. But if you go to the next slide, this is the same map. But um, if we look at the indigenous tribes and the people who have been existing here since before all of our states were formed, um, this map looks very different. Um, we don't have those square borders that are dividing everything in neat little packages. And so maps also, there's a whole, I feel like this could be a whole separate talk and I am not a cartographer at all by any means, but the history of maps and how we can lie with maps and how maps tell different stories is definitely something that you can get into a rabbit hole in if you like researching stuff like I do. Um, but this is just another way that, you know, when we're teaching young people, like this is where we live, this is the land that we inhabit, they're not seeing this map, they're seeing the map of the states usually. So that's another way the data can really be biased. Um, and so the other point that I would like to get across is that data has consequences. Um, there is a need for us to be really mindful and ethical when we're assessing data. I think that working in a public health space and working with especially um, populations of people who have been historically left out of research just brings this added level of really needing to be sincere and compassionate and understanding with data because you might put the you put these numbers out in an infographic you put out your report but once it's out of your hands I mean you, you push send it's out of your hands but that data will have real consequences so um Another example of how data can really reshape the world, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, this is the actual real chart that was approved by the FDA um, in the late 90s, early 2000s from Purdue Pharma. Um, and so I want you to pay attention to on the uh, Y axis that where the orange circle is. As you can see, it kind of looks like we have these uh, trend lines and slopes that are kind of flattening out relatively, you know, it's a it's a very smooth kind of decline. And we're not seeing any sort of jagged peaks or weird jumps. Um, this was basically communicating to people if you, I know that the numbers are a little bit small, but these are different doses of Oxycontin and this graph is arguing that the dose levels remain fairly constant in your bloodstream um, as it's being processed metabolically. So they're saying that, you know, we have this wonderful drug that's going to have no side effects and people will not have any kind of withdrawal symptoms because it stays relatively level and moderate in your bloodstream and it will provide constant pain relief to people. You can go to the next slide now. So this was, like I said, the exact marketing tool. It's been published. If you look up the Purdue Pharma um, pages that have been all part of Congress, um, this is what it was. So now we're gonna go to the next slide. This is what the actual chart would look like if they had <laughs> showed the data in a way that was um, you know, more accurate. If you look at that um, Y axis again, 
the drug actually is dropping off a lot more rapidly. And this is just one way. There's a book that came out in, I think, like the 1960s called How to Lie with Statistics. It's a classic book. It's kind of outdated. It's a little bit cheesy, but um, I totally recommend it for people to take a look at. It's very short, very thin book, but it shows like this is something that's really used in marketing a lot. And for people who maybe are not as familiar with data or how to read graphs or how to determine what kind of information is trying to be conveyed, it's really manipulative and really shady. So instead of using um, this logarithmic, they were using a logarithmic scale on this one rather than a linear scale, which is the correct graph. Um, if you wanna go back or you can go two slides ahead and it'll show them next to each other. Um, that's a pretty big difference. <laughs> um, the dose curve is not the same at all. And so this second graph was not um, what was advertised in the marketing of Oxycontin. And this really contributed to the opioid epidemic as we know it. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, it was part uh, in part because of that graph. Um, and so there was the public narrative that these drugs are not addictive, right? But it was, we know that obviously now <laughs> with the knowledge that we have now, but because it was addictive, they had to keep creating larger and larger doses of the drug um, to be able to keep up with patient demand and to manage their pain levels. So originally Oxycontin came out, it was in 10 milligram, 20, 40, 80 milligram tablets. Um, but as more and more people were being prescribed this medication and their tolerance was, you know, building to this drug, um, they had to start making even stronger tablets. So in July of 2000, which is where I put a little error on this graph, is when they started marketing the 160 milligram tablets of Oxycontin. And as you can see, um, this is how we get to where we are today, basically. I think there's not anyone in this room that could argue that that um, the opioid crisis didn't happen. It's still devastating a lot of communities. Um, I am from rural Appalachia and the opioid epidemic is pretty much started in my neck of the woods and it, it's devastating to communities. And this is just one reason why data is not just data. It has consequences when we put it out there. And we have a responsibility of being um, responsible stewards of data to make sure that when we're collecting data, we're being responsible and being honest and open with it, even if it means it's not, you know, going to sell your drug or whatever you're doing with it. Um, so we can go to the next slide. This is all to just say data is really powerful. Data is what keeps the cog, the cog rolling in the machine, even if the machine is messed up. Anytime you're working in a public health um, sort of capacity, data is really the building blocks for how we figure out what we're doing, if it's working, if there are changes that need to be made, what is our impact? How are we, how are the services that we are providing changing people's lives? Are, are we doing the right thing? And if we're not, how do we change that? And so data has really incredible powers for good and bad, depending on how you wield it, basically. And to kind of bring this back, um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I kind of want to talk about the concept of data genocide, which is a term that was coined by Abigail Echo Hawk with the Urban Indian Health Institute. And this is an example of how specifically indigenous people have been left out of data for so long. Um, if you've ever tried to do any kind of data analysis with po different populations and you're trying to de-aggregate these um, large numbers based on like race or ethnicity, a lot of times, most of the time, um, when you get to indigenous people uh, in a report, they just say, we don't have that data. And it's not that they're not, well, sometimes they're not collecting it at all, but sometimes it's that the sample sizes are so small and they're not putting enough effort into really trying to connect with this population where there is a small sample size. So it's just kind of ignored. And so this has been something that's it's still, it's an ongoing problem. Um, and so this lack of data, they're not, indigenous people are not being represented in data and data is how we 
show that people either have a need or that there is some need um, for focused, you know, interventions or anything like that. But if they're missing, then we just have this entire subset of a population that's just gone, like they're invisible. And Indigenous people obviously are left out of so many different aspects of our culture today in the United States, but data genocide is one thing that I think I feel very strongly and passionate about trying to make sure that anytime I'm collecting data that I am looking at these people, um, you know, all people, different um, race and ethnicities and de-aggregating them because no two populations are going to be the same. And so while data genocide specifically looking about, you know, the lack of representation of indigenous people in data, this can really be extended to any kind of population. So when I'm talking about like, for example, when you're looking at um, population data, if you wanted to look at Hispanic people, that is a huge group, it's not monolithic. Not all Hispanic people are from this like same country. Uh, people from Mexico are not going to behave the same way as people from Cuba, you know. Um, and this is why it's really important that we try to get as granular of data as possible. Um, that does make collecting data more difficult sometimes because it means that we're going to have to oversample. We're going to have to go out of our way to reach certain populations, and you know that comes with its own. Um, complications because there is a, a rightful mistrust, especially if you're coming from a um, government agency into certain populations that have been harmed by the U.S. government in the past, like indigenous folks. Um, like, why are you coming in here and taking this information about us? We're not getting any of this data back. Like, what are you doing? So um, if you want to go to the next slide. And this is pulled directly from Decolonizing Data, which is a little report that was put out by the Urban Indian Health Institute. It's so easy to read, beautiful graphics, love it. It's free online, you can find it. Um, and all of these are directly from that. But if you wanna screenshot this or anything like that, feel free. But this is basically what we can do. These are the tangible steps we can take to make sure that the data that we're interacting with um, is decolonized to the best of our ability. And it's really not anything that should be like mind blowing. Um, <laughs> a lot of this, it, it's, this is the best practice to how to handle any kind of data. So, you know, acknowledging that harmful data practices do exist. And so that's kind of why I wanted to set the stage with like, you know, how we even approach data from a statistical and mathematical standpoint has been biased by people who do not have the best interest of all people at heart. Like that's the foundation block of this. So it, it, being cognizant of that is really important, I think. Um, we also tend to have um, a very like deficits-based um, approach when it comes to um, data dissemination and things like that. If you've ever heard of like a SWOT analysis, um, strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, and I'm totally blanking on what the other ones, but we can re we can switch that just a little bit to having an assets-based approach and rather than looking at a community or a set of data and saying, this is what they don't have, it's more helpful and productive if we can say, you know what, this is what this community does have and this is what they're really good at and building on those strengths rather than build like focusing on any kind of negative attributes. Like, I just feel like that seems very obvious to me, but it's not, that's not the way that um, a lot of individuals in public health have been trained historically. Um, it's important to make sure that any kind, any time that you're interacting with data with a community specifically, that the community is on board and involved every single step of the way. The minute I would want to like approach some kind of project specifically with like a tribe, I'm not making any moves, any decisions unless the tri like tribal representatives are there. It's their data. This is the concept of um, tribal data sovereignty. This is their data. It's not mine. I might be um, providing some of my expertise for like, you know, how we might want to look at the data. But at the end of the day, this is the community's data. They're in charge of it and they should lead the way with how we move through it, how that data is communicated. And um, even though that also seems very simple, um, once you get into 
large organizations, sometimes um, there's this need um, to really kind of hustle through and like, oh, we just, we need to get this signed off on X, Y, Z. And those are, I think, are the places where I've seen most often that um, this kind of seems to fly out the window, like this isn't important anymore. But it's really important when you're using communities data to be able to stand there um, and tell people we need to stop we need to pause because if you're rushing data, the data that you get is not going to be good anyway. So it's better to take it step by step, take it a little bit slowly and work through it with the community so that you have actually good results <laughs> and that you want to share with people. Um, I don't want to spend time going through every single one of these one by one because I know everyone um, can can take a peek at these, but uh, uh Basically, the most important part that I really want to make sure folks know is that anytime you're interacting with data, um, make sure that the community that you're working with is a part of the entire process from the development to the end. Um, and now I just have some very brief reminders for me to you who might be aspiring evaluators or epidemiologists. Um, data point, especially when we're working with data in public health fields, it's really important to remember that these data points are not just numbers. This is a person, it's a community, and they have a story. Um, if I, you know, talking about how sometimes folks are left out of data analysis for having small sample sizes, well, okay, we have a small sample size of eight people, but that's still eight people. Just saying that the, that data is insignificant is really offensive and not really true. Um, that's a whole other talk that we could get into, but just remember that your data is representing a very real thing and um, it's not just a number. Um, we can go to the next one. Kind of leaning off that statistical significance is not the end all be all. Um, a lot of the it's a cop out. I think when people just have a report out there and they say we can't report on this uh, group of people because they're not statistically significant. Um, what they really probably are what they should be saying is that we're not as confident in the um, data for this population because it's a small sample size, but this is where it's important to also um, couple quantitative data with numbers with the qualitative data, which is also really not uplifted enough, I think, especially when you're working with um, folks from different cultures where like indigenous folks where storytelling is such a huge part of the culture, um, you're not going to be able to adequately represent uh, and convey these um, feelings and emotions and lived experiences through just numbers. That's just not the way that that works. <laughs> so also, hopefully at the beginning of this, if you were not aware of our founding fathers of statistics and their dubious past, um, be critical if someone is ever saying like, this is the way we've done it, this is the way we've always done it. Um, obviously there, uh, there's reasons why, you know, methodologies stay a certain way, but it's important to ask yourself why um, and, you know, who who's presenting this information to you? Um, are they being funded by an outside party? Do they have a bias to what kind of information that they're trying to present to you? Um, just think critically about any kind of data you have because data can be really tricky as hopefully you can, my, the examples from earlier might see, those are really big egregious cases, but good to know. Um, something else that I think um, <laughs> I've encountered a lot in my career, um, you're not always going to be the expert. Even if you're supposed to be the expert in the room, there's always gonna be someone who knows more than you or something different than you, and that's okay. Um, white supremacy culture will tell us that we have to be perfect all the time and that we have to know everything and that we can't make mistakes. And that's just not realistic to the human experience. Um, we are humans, we are flawed and we will make mistakes. And it is not a flaw to ask for help or to say, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna try and figure that out for you. And that's why it's so important um, 
to start making connections. And that's why I think Clue is so fabulous is because you're meeting these people in different walks of life and different careers that you can connect with. And if you, maybe you don't know the answer to it, but you might know a person who would know. And so it's okay to not be the expert all the time. And my other three points, data is biased and it has consequences and it's powerful. So, um, and to be cheesy with my last slide, I think this is my last slide coming up pretty much, but um, with great data um, comes great responsibility. Um, as you might be familiar from the wise words of Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, great power comes great responsibility. When you have data, you have a lot of responsibility in your hands and there's a lot of ethical considerations to keep in mind as you're dealing with that data. So just, you know, be respectful and humble when you're dealing with data. <laughs> um, if you are curious about this, because I have very, very, like just the tip of the iceberg with all of this information and I could talk about data literally all day, every day for like in a million different directions. But if you want to go to the next slide, um, there's a couple recommendations that I have if you want to kind of keep this percolating in your mind. If you want to read more, these are places where I would totally recommend um, folks um, connecting with or reaching out, you know, reading these books, connecting with like the We All Count website. These are fabulous places to start. Um, obviously, also, you can connect with me. Um, if you would like, um, I'm always happy to talk about data with anyone in any capacity because it's like my number one favorite thing to talk about. And I think it's so interesting and humans are natural evaluators and natural scientists. So you're doing this kind of work all the time, even if you don't think that you're doing it. And that's all I got. Unless you have questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Camille. That was really informative. Um, I think that, you know, I think, but prior to this presentation, I was like, yeah, data can be manipulated, but like to see those like very huge examples that have kind of changed the, um, I don't know, really big moments in public health history um, with when you mentioned the opioid crisis and then also like COVID-19 and the impact that it had in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so thank you so much for going through that. Um, I have a question um, for you, a few questions for you. And I also wanna give other folks an opportunity as well. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or um, feel free to use the raise hand feature, come on camera, come off mute. Um, this is a really community oriented space. And so, yeah, if you'd like to ask your question in that way, you're more than welcome to. Um, but my question for you is as, um, public health practitioners who we might use data in order to um, implement different interventions, to implement evidence-based um, initiatives in order to solve a health problem. How can we, like when we're looking at the data and the science, what are the specific things that we should kind of be looking for to determine, um, to better take an assessment of how the data is biased, because you did say like most data is biased. So how, what are things that we should look for um, to make those determinations? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm so thankful. I had a whole class in this in undergrad about basically like how to analyze a journal article. And honestly, usually it kind of comes down to that. So if you're um, reading in the news, some kind of article that's putting out some sort of statistic saying, you know, X percent of people are doing a particular thing. Um, the first thing you want to do is see like where where are they cited? Where is this coming from? Is it coming from a survey? Is it coming from a journal article? Uh, is it just quoted from someone? So always look at who is saying this data fact, this statement. Um, usually, as you um, look into like, if you click through an article, they're usually cited. Luckily anything valid should be cited <laughs> in general. So uh, that's a red flag. If there's just a number out there and there isn't kind of any source at all, that's usually an indicator that mm, maybe this isn't real. Um, if you can go and look at the actual journal article, look at the authors. Um, usually most journals will um, have a section where folks have to declare if they have any conflict of interest. 
So if um, there's someone putting out uh, data in a cancer journal, but they're being funded by the commercial tobacco industry, um, that's a bit of a red flag because mm, there's going to be some industry influence with that most likely. Um, so you can look up the authors if you're really curious, if you're um, not sure about their credentials or, you know, are they um, qualified to be speaking on this specific thing. Um, we have Google now, type their names into Google, see what they've been doing. Um, that's that's usually the quickest way um, to kind of get a good feel for that. And also important to know where your trusted sources are. So like um, with the National LGBT Cancer Network, if you came to our website to look at data on cancer specific and LGBT populations, we would be a trusted source because we, we're we going to look at these sources for you. Um, we're going to do our due diligence when we're doing any kind of research or putting out any data ourselves. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So, thank you. And then um, Marina asked a question in the chat and I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, how does this decolonization approach inform your work with the National LGBTQ or LGBT Cancer Network? <laughs> I feel like um, if you go the the slide that I had with like the the ten different um, ways to decolonize your data, even though it's specifically written um, from an indigenous perspective, I think it really can be applied to any kind of population in general that you're working with. So anytime that I'm doing work with the network, I am making sure that, the community that I'm working with, which it might be the LGBT community most often, or cancer survivors, I want to make sure that their voices and their thoughts and considerations are incorporated throughout the entire data life cycle. So it means starting with key informant interviews, um, focus groups, making sure, you know, like we're capturing data that really reflects the lived experiences of the people that we're um, supposed to be serving. And so for me, decolonization of my data of data is kind of, it's almost like a complementary data equity, health equity lens to apply to anything that I do. Um, I'm just like extra cognizant of these things, especially if I'm working with tribal communities, obviously, um, making sure that, you know, I am not the expert in any, <laughs> any tribe. Like that's, I, I'm not the expert of any community's lived experience. I'm the expert of my own lived experience, but I can't speak for or generalize anything for any other group of people. So um, making sure that the practices that I'm using are not harming communities, making sure that as I'm communicating data, it's using that asset-based approach rather than that kind of um, reductive sort of like deficit a base <laughs> approach that is really been historically used in a lot of public health research. Um, so those are kind of examples and ways that I do that. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you. So I'm curious to know your input on, um, I, I think, you, and you also mentioned this within your presentation about how in a lot of indigenous communities, um, there are, there's data that lives within stories. And I think that stands true for a lot of other um, racial and ethnic groups that are also not really represented in data at all. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how we can be advocates for th that type of qualitative data um, in order to, um, for us to have the best stories in order to have the best data to implement um, said interventions or programs that are gonna be most useful to those communities? Yeah, I love approaching data and I, I usually tell people like I'm a data storyteller because data should be telling stories. Um, when you're looking at a graph, um, like I said earlier, sometimes it's really confusing. Some people don't have the lived experience or um, have not had to go to the ivory tower to learn how to read these complicated scientific, you know, um, journal articles and things like that. But the way that I see it, if you understand a concept, you should be able to communicate it to a young person. Like, 
like my, <laughs> like my nephew, who's like four years old, like there should be a way that we can simplify this kind of information that we're talking about. Um, and one way to do that, you know, when I was in school, uh, because I was trained as a biochemist, um, the idea was you put the data out there, you put the graph out there, and the numbers should speak for themselves. But we know now that it really doesn't. <laughs> and when people look at that, they're going to come and approach, like, view this information through their own lived experience, and there will be a narrative in their head, whether or not it's true or false. Um, so it's better, we know now through different research that when you're presenting data, it's better to have that narrative surrounding it and setting people up for, you know, what the actual um, root cause of something might be. So if I'm presenting, for example, um, some information on different commercial, um, commercial tobacco smoking rates in different populations of people, um, historically, we might just throw those numbers out there and be like, this community smokes, you know, 10 times more than this other community. And that's really, <laughs> that's not taking the assets-based approach. And it's also putting the blame on that population. Whereas we know that what's actually to blame is, just, you know, the commercial tobacco industry and a lot of industry targeting, um, structural racism, um, <laughs> microaggressions. These are all things that really kind of come together to um, create this um, this effect that we're seeing in a population. And so a way to get that narrative and to really understand as we're, you know, obviously we're thinking about these data points as people because they are people um, talking to them. That's why it's so important for the like qualitative data, I think, in gathering those stories and hearing firsthand from individuals within the communities that we're working with, you know, what is your lived experience? What is your history with this? You know, um, we work really closely, obviously, like <laughs> working um, with cancer and commercial tobacco uh, within my role here. And so sometimes that means talking with people and like, what is your family's history in relationship with tobacco? And it's going to be very different depending on the population you're working with. If we're working with indigenous populations, tobacco isn't a tobacco is a sacred medicine in many indigenous communities. It's not um, what we're familiar with with cigarettes and cigars, things like that. Those are <laughs> um appropriated from indigenous cultures by the commercial tobacco industry and um you know it's a poison it's not a medicine the way that they use it is very different um so collecting those stories and understanding the people and making sure that you put that narrative framework around the data that you're presenting so that when someone is digesting whatever sort of graph or data point that you're trying to get across that you know, the blame is actually placed on the system that is supporting this inequity rather than the individual person. Because I would say like almost every single time, it's not an individual's fault for of the consequence of these health disparities that we see. Um, there's a larger problem behind that. And it's okay to present that information with the data. Because when it's being digested by an individual who's seeing these things together, they can really put that together and be like, oh, you know, this really isn't just about, um, sorry, <laughs> my plant light just went out. Um, this isn't just about, you know, me and my relationship with, you know, a certain substance. It's, there's a whole lot to consider. Sorry, I could ramble about this for a while. <laughs> Thanks, Emil. Um, and I see we'll have one more question. I think we have one more. And Charlie, um, you have your hand up. So if you would like to come off mute and, and ask your question, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to try typing it and then it was too complicated, too many words. Um, so honestly, I've had a conversation with you about this thing before, but I do think it's kind of important, even as we're just talking about it, to also remember, like, when we're putting together some sort of like community survey, I'm like a very novice data person doing community work. Like we're talking about the invisibilization of, of within data if you're not asking the questions, if we're not like gathering that data, but like, do you have kind of like go-to references? Like how do you figure out what, 
I'm kind of trying to ask like what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like it's one of those where you can't just leave like everything to be a fill in the blank. Like as far as analyzing data, that's like a real nightmare. But like, mm -hmm. I feel like I don't always know like what options should I have here? What what am I missing if I'm just putting, you know, this drop down menu on a survey? Um, mm -hmm. So like, how do we be inclusive without having it be like the most overwhelming survey of all time? Mm -hmm. um, and what, is your, what are your thoughts on that, I guess? That's a great question. And I think if I had the 100% answer to that, I would, I, I don't know. I don't think anyone has the 100% answer to that. But I think that this is where usually when I'm in a situation like this, I always start with like, okay, we want to do this survey. First of all, why? Why do you want to do the survey? What are you trying to get out of it? What are you trying to figure out? Um, there is um, a lot of over surveying all the time, especially with young people. If you're working with young people, um, survey fatigue is a real thing. <laughs> um, and so we don't want to uh, do that. We also know that um, long surveys, even though for data people, they're amazing because we want to analyze everything as an individual person taking like a hundred question survey, like that's overwhelming and I have better things to do with my time. So we have to be really thoughtful about the, the questions that we do choose. So really starting um, having a clear uh, question that you're trying to answer, something you're trying to figure out when you're approaching any kind of survey. Um, and if you know that you're, you know, going to be working with a specific, you know, community, um, like a certain city that you want to survey, this is where it would be important before you start um, necessarily like locking in those survey questions to have conversations with individuals within that community um, so that, you know, what questions did they have? Like, what did they want to know? Like in um, relation to the topic, um, what, um, what are the histories of the people living there? So like, there's a lot of conversation and relationship building that I think really needs to go on before you really solidify a survey um, that will start getting your head moving in the right direction um, as you're getting into the more like nitty gritty about like how do we actually ask about you know soji questions sexual orientation gender identity questions which are important to capture um, you also need to ask yourself, are you actually going to use the data? That is like the number one thing, because I feel like there are a lot of times people will collect data and then the community never sees what comes of it. So it's very extractive and we don't want to be that way, obviously, if we're going to approach data from this decolonized lens. So if we're coming into a community to ask them these questions, they need to see what the result of all of this analysis and these questions are going to be, whether that's a report or an infographic or a presentation or anything like that. So ask yourself first, like, do we really need this question? Is this question something that we need to answer our first initial question that we had, like what we want to get out of this study or survey or whatever we're doing. Um, and then there's also the aspect of you just kind of have to, you have to do your research, which is why it's great to have a large um, network of people who might be experts in different fields that you're not an expert in. Um, I know that I have um, other epidemiologists that I know specialize in different um, like topics uh, within their career. And so maybe I don't know how to ask this question in a thoughtful, respectful way, but they might. So being able to reach out to folks for that, um, usually looking at any kind of um, respected national organizations or anything, um, looking at those trusted sources that you've maybe already vetted, seeing if they have um, uh, done anything like that. Also, usually uh, any kind of survey that you're going to do, someone somewhere has probably done it before. <laughs> and so seeing what other communities have done um, with surveys that are similar to, to um, what you're interested in doing, like what were the outcomes of that? Um, did they, you know, usually that's the importance of as we're taking in this data, the importance of communicating it out and sharing it so that other people can learn from um, any mistakes that we might have made or things that worked super well. 
Um, but uh, survey and like locking in those questions, it's a very, um, it's not a one and done sort of situation. You're going to have a lot of conversations with a lot of different people and going through the questions probably way more times than you want to before you actually give it out to people. Um, and that's why like survey design is a whole other <laughs> ball game. Um, but that's a really good question. I wish I had a perfect answer to that, but it's it's just a lot of talking and a lot of reading and learning and listening. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a great answer. Um, awesome. So that is that kind of concludes our career talk for today. Thank you so much and Miel for coming on and sharing. Um, I know we didn't get into the nitty gritty of how you got into this work. Maybe we can do that another time, but I think the meat of um, how you navigate around um, the data that you use within each of the positions that you're in and kind of how what you, the knowledge that you've acquired um, was really important. So thank you so much for sharing uh, with us today. Uh, we're just gonna close out with a few announcements um, and then I'll let you all on your way. So if you wanna go to the next, slide shy. Um, so we have our paper, um, we have opened our paper and poster contest. So this is our third iteration of this. If you are a student and you would like to submit a paper or, or a project of any kind um, that you've worked on this semester, um, please do. Submissions are due January 5th um, at midnight. Um, and then I will go ahead and drop in the chat um, so you could see past um, submissions that have won, um, and also what the instructions are for submitting into that as well. Um, the second thing that we want to make you all aware about is so we had our student advisory committee informational meeting last week. Um, and if you are interested in being a part of that committee, um, please let us know. We can either send you the recording of the informational meeting or just um, the letter of commitment that you need to sign um, in order to sign on to be a part of the committee. Um, some of the things that would consist as a part of that advisory committee is attending monthly meetings, providing feedback to the Cancer Leaders Like Us program, helping plan a public health centered event, um, promote student engagement so that other people can learn more about Cancer Leaders Like Us. And then you are also a reviewer for the Health and Disparities Student Paper and Poster Contest. The only thing that's different, I think main thing that's different from, um, from the last cohort of advisors to this cohort of advisors is that we're going to be doing um, a kind of a, a one, a little bit longer of a time commitment. So it'll go from November 2023 until September 2024. Um, that way that we'll have all the time that we need to do all of these wonderful things. And then next slide. Um, if you haven't um, officially signed up to be a part of Cancer Leaders Like Us, um, please submit a participant profile. This is open for anyone that is a student, emerging leader. If you are already a professional in the field and you're doing the great work and you want to get involved or potentially come and talk to students or be connected in a mentorship way, please let us know. Um, you can go ahead and um, sign up during for by completing a participant profile, which helps us get a little bit more information about some of the things that you're looking for and what, what background you have coming in. Um, and I think that is everything. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, to me or Shai or Emil. I know we dropped Emil's email um, in the chat earlier, um, but we're happy to keep these conversations going and, and be a resource um, if you all need in any of the projects that you're working on, as long as it's, um, you know, obviously within our capacity, like we want to build capacity here. And so that's, you know, one of the things that we aim to do a little bit beyond knowledge sharing. So thank you everybody for coming. This was a wonderful event and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Bye everyone. Great job. Good job, Emma. Thanks.